All right. Hello, or good morning or good evening. I just realized I don't know what time the audience is watching. Um, welcome to Meaning of Life. Uh, I think this is going to be uh, a Sophia episode, but I forgot to ask Dan, so I'm not sure. Um, so if you're part of the Sophia audience, welcome. And if you're not, welcome. Um, Carson, do you care to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh Hi, my name is Carson Young. Um, I am an assistant professor of management at um, the college at Brockport of the State University of New York. Um, and I'm especially interested in kind of business ethics and like applied issues in economic and commercial ethics, corporate social responsibility, uh, things like that. So I'm going to make you brag about your new distinction. Um, All right. Um, so I, uh, I got, I got, uh, I recently completed my dissertation at, uh, the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and just got a, uh, a best dissertation award from the, uh, Society for Business Ethics for 2019, which was a, a nice way of, um, you know, finishing off the long dissertation process on a positive note. Yeah. Congratulations, man. Thank you. I should say we're also, uh, friends from Georgia State. Yes, we go we go way back. <laughs> well, now you're making me feel old, but uh, <laughs> time to get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I contacted you on Facebook. You're one of a number of people I end up texting on Facebook late at night. Um, because I'm really annoyed about something and you make me less annoyed. It's, uh, you, you, JP and Brian are all on that list. And, um, the thing that I happen to be really annoyed about on this, oh, I never introduced myself. I'm David Otlinger. You already know who I am because I'm here all the time. I write for the electric Agora. Anyway, um, the thing I was really annoyed about moments before um, talking to you was there was yet another kind of Twitter mob um, looking to start a boycott. And this is something it's like, you know, like remember when the Flintstones would walk and you'd see like the same lamp and table go around like multiple times and again and again and again. Sure. <clears throat> um, it's one of those experiences I have where it's like open Twitter. Somebody's calling for a boycott of X. Somebody's calling for a boycott of Y. Z. It's the same tone, the same idea. It's just the target changes week to week. And um, <coughs> the, I started thinking about this, and it just seemed like um, people are really gung-ho about doing these kinds of things in a way that I'm not. Um, but I'm not particularly sure why I'm not. So the one that got me to talking to you was this Jimmy John's. There was a hashtag for a while, boycott Jimmy John's, um, or some form of that. Um, and so what had happened was there, the CEO, current CEO of the Jimmy John's sandwich a shop franchise um, was pictured uh, smiling next to, was it a rhino? I think I saw a picture of an elephant. But an elephant. Yeah, a, I think it was an elephant, an yeah. elephant he just shot. Um, so apparently he's a big game guy and he went and shot a higher mammal, which is capable of painting and um, mourning. Uh, and, uh, that is a bad thing to do. I agree. That's a bad thing to do. But for this, um, people wanted to boycott Jimmy John's and I kept thinking about, okay, this guy did something which I think is bad and which a lot of other people think is bad. And, um, you know, uh, it's quite, quite within reason to say something about that. But then I thought if we boycott the company, uh, what happens to 
um, workers, what happens to um, people who own Jimmy John's franchises who are not this person. They answer to this person within an organization at some level of abstraction, but um, they uh, also have uh, their own lives and a separate stake in the company, pretty independent stake in the company in some ways. Um, this a successful boycott would hurt them. And this, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't like the company put out a statement that said, Hey, we, as the company, Jimmy John's support shooting elephants. It was just something this guy did independently. So I started thinking about all these things and how no one else seemed to be thinking about them. And I got dizzy, and that's when I called you. So, I'm, I mean, we'll, we'll, we're going to talk through boycotts, but um, do you have any – did you have an immediate reaction to the Jimmy John's thing? Because I think I brought it to you, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you brought it to me. And I'd seen it before. I mean, one weird thing about the Jimmy John's thing is that it's not new, right? I mean, I uh, – so I believe that this picture is, like, years old. Um, and has been, uh, it's kind of, it seems to go viral, like in waves. Um, I, I didn't catch on to that part of the controversy at all. Yeah. So it's almost, it's almost something that, um, so I think, uh, a few years ago, I found an article saying a few years ago where, where Jimmy John, uh, Lyotod, or however you pronounce his name, oh, yeah. the, the founder of and I think current, current chairman of Jimmy John's uh, said, you know, I, I, I'm not into the big game hunting anymore. I don't do that. And I think that was, that was like three or four years ago. Wow. Um, so, um, uh, so, so you sort of have the, the aftershocks <laughs> of uh, this one very bad PR moment sort of reverberating across social media. Um, so, so far without a, without a clear end. So that gets yet another feature of sort of these internet scandal dynamics. Is right. It? Right. I mean, they can become, uh, you know, when, when you're relying mostly on just what is contained in a photo or a tweet, I guess, a lot of the surrounding information uh, gets, gets lost. Okay. <clears throat> so much for Jimmy Jones, because it doesn't matter anyway. But there, there, there have been so many of these, as I said, like that table going around the Flintstones. But yes. A lot, most of them, it's like within 48 hours, everybody's forgotten and nothing really happens, but not always. Um, the most, uh, I think probably the most successful from the point of view of the activists was the Chick-fil-A kind of boycott where people at least in the sense that it had some staying power and a lot of people seem to actually at least say they weren't buying from Chick-fil-A anymore. Yeah. So it didn't just van. It's not like people just forgot about it after a few days. Right. Successful in that sense. Yeah. Yes. Right. Not necessarily politically, though we'll get to that. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, and do you remember the uh, Uber? Yeah. Yeah, well, there have been a few of Uber, but um, there's the cancel Uber one related right. to, like, uh, you know, what is is the New York taxi drivers. So after the after uh, the Trump administration first instated the Muslim ban or the travel ban mm -hmm. uh, in, what was that? I think it was January 2017. Um, the, in protest of that, the New York taxi drivers um stopped picking people up from jfk airport for an hour and uh uber kept picking people up during that hour um mm -hmm. and also uh you know normally uber has surge pricing um uber mm -hmm. dropped its surge pricing during that hour um and that generated some social media backlash and a cancel uber ha hashtag um that that's the incident you have in mind i take yeah. Um, yeah. There's a whole other thing with Uber about sexual harassment, but that was. Yeah. Right. Right. With Uber, you have to be specific about the scandal you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kara Swisher is very proud of the fact that uh, apparently the new CEO after the last one stepped down, thanked her 
for his new job at a <laughs> at a party. Um, yeah, so I, I, I go through that just to say I'm not making this up. This has been like a really regular feature of civic life. Um, people, yeah. a lot of people support these ideas, and there's a whole kind of uh, ethical consumerist um, movement. Uh, which uh, we'll touch on. Right. So, and I would also, I would also say real quick, maybe, I mean, these are a few examples of what, what seem to be more boycotts coming from the left. Um, yeah, that's right. But uh, I mean, I'm not sure to what extent this is a phenomenon of the left. You've also <laughs> got, you know, boycotts of the NFL after mm-hmm. uh Colin Kaepernick Mm -hmm. uh, kneeling in protest of police violence against black Americans. Mm -hmm. You've got night boycotts of Nike and people like, you know, burning and shredding their Nike socks and cutting, cutting their, uh, the Nike swoosh out of the socks, which would destroy the socks. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Strange. strange. (laughs) Right. Um, You know, I guess part, part of the price of owning the libs, but uh, (laughs) Uh, but yeah, so this, you know, this, this kind of boycott culture seems, seems to come from both kind of all areas of the political spectrum as far as I can see. Well, I guess the more, the more culture war activated parts of the political spectrum. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. No, that's fair. I'm usually harping on my own on the left, but, um, it's a fair point to say that this does seem to be a, a bipartisan phenomenon. So <clears throat> we're just going to talk through uh, ethics and sort of political philosophy of boycotts. So I, I specifically thought of you because um, you've thought a lot more about the intersection of ethics and politics and markets and economics. Uh, so, I, I think the natural place to start is what I'd call sort of the banal worries about um, boycotts, which I already sort of hit upon. Um, yeah. I, the, with, I, I started noting it with Jeffrey Epstein, too, after the Epstein revelations. Now, Epstein's, uh, there's still allegations, but there's a lot of evidence that he cr- committed crimes of real enormity. Um, I don't want to downplay that. And he was convicted of some of them. Well, right. Yeah. At at an earlier date, he was convicted of, I believe, procuring minors for for sex or prostitution, um, which is, yeah, that's a very serious crime in and of itself. But But yes, he hasn't been convicted of all of the allegations. Right. Um, and won't be because he's dead. Uh, yes, that's okay. true. Yeah. Um, but it was coming out that he had handled some people's money, and I saw people at least proposing to boycott the companies that had had some business with Jeffrey Epstein um, before at least the most recent wave of allegations and possibly before even he was uh, registered as a sex offender because that didn't happen all that long ago. Uh, He he was certainly handling people's money before that. Um, So, and then I was thinking, you know, if people succeeded in boycotting Victoria's Secret or uh, whatever other company, um, it would hurt workers. It would hurt franchise owners. It would hurt um, uh, various kinds of people who are not, the people that the boycotters are setting out to influence. Um, So how do we weigh those harms? And um, what what do we say about the sort of collateral damage to more or less innocent people? Right. Um, Great question. And I, um, I'm still a little bit under unsure about what, what I think about this particular issue. I mean, I guess on the one hand, it seems to me that, you know, if a boycott is sort of well justified, if it if it uh, addresses uh, an important cause in a reasonably effective way, then 
it's a little hard for me to see how kind of collateral damage would to like, you know, innocent third parties, like employees of a company being boycotted would um, be a strong reason not to do it. Like, um, you know, thinking about like the boycott of uh, South African companies towards mm-hmm. the end of apartheid in the eighties. Yeah. You know, if you learn that some of the employees of that company might be hurt by that boycott, if they're innocent, then, you know, that's regrettable. Um, uh, I, you know, we're, we're, they, they don't deserve that if we're assuming that they, they are innocent. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm not sure that I would say, Oh, well, you know, you might, you might be hurting innocent workers in apartheid South Africa. So you shouldn't be, uh, uh, boycotting, um, apartheid companies if you're active in, you know, the mid eighties, um, because you might hurt workers that, that seems, uh, that seems mistaken to me. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I'd say in general, <clears throat> it is usually the case that um, advancing an important political cause um, involves hurting someone in some way. Um, very often someone who's not directly responsible for any wrong. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I think, as I'm thinking about it now, and it seems to me there is a difference. Um, and apartheid is a good example. I myself was thinking of the segregationist South back in the 1950s yeah. and 60s. So there were a, a lot of boycotting of segregated businesses back, you know, in the civil rights era. And those are boycotts that I think most of us look back on as being very uh, – Profitable, one of the sort of brighter chapters in the moral history of America. Um, but, you know, when you have something like apartheid or segregation in the South, that's a sort of civilization wide phenomenon that uh, almost everyone is implicated in. Uh, to some extent, not at all to the same extent, but, you know, the business owner in a segregated South obviously did not invent segregation, might even disagree with segregation, but um, chose to segregate their own business. Um, Even the people who uh, would be, say, waiting tables at a segregated restaurant would be following all the rules of segregation and so, sort of administrating the segregated state, right? Uh, the segregated, segregated society. And I think, you know, black people had a right to say, well, aren't you responsible? You know, I realize you don't want to get fired. I realize you don't want to be the one to stand up and try to change the, the whole country. But, um, Nonetheless, you are sort of implicated as an administrator of this. It's very different when we have this sort of Jimmy Jones type situation where people are focusing on the wrongs of a single person. And it's not like the whole company is implicated in this particular wrong. Uh, and that seems, and the same thing would be true for the Jeffrey Epstein case, I think, uh, How about for Chick-fil-A? So that's a case Mm -hmm. where, I mean, I think it's largely based on the, the views of, of Dan Cathy, the CEO, Mm -hmm. but uh, I believe that the company of Chick-fil-A also, you know, espoused similar religious commitments and opposition to, to gay marriage um, donated to organizations like focus on the family. Um, Does that make a difference? Do you think? I would say that it uh, makes a difference to me that it was the company, not um, not just an executive. Um, I don't know how many of these cases we want to introduce, but one that really one that really bothered me was, and it was, this, this, is in the, this was one of the ones that kind of disappeared after a few minutes, but uh, Barilla Pasta. Um, yeah. You remember this? I remember it coming up, but I don't remember what it was about right now. So it was remind fair, me. It was fairly soon after the Supreme Court gay marriage decision um, came down. 
uh, the person who I, th- I don't remember if he was still involved in the company when he made the statement, but he, he was one of the, I think one of the founders of the company had been CEO, something like that. He, he had been very high up in the company, um, made a statement as espousing his own personal views against gay marriage. And also um, at the same time, associating, he, he um, said that Barilla was as a company against uh gay marriage and uh, that something that they printed on their package to him represented sort of heterosexual, heteronormative ideas of the family. The company as a whole then repudiated him and said, we, Barilla Pasta, believe in equality for everyone, blah, blah, blah. And they basically, he did not rescind his statement, but he they shut him up. Um, so he just stopped talking about it. <laughs> and that was the case. And even after that, people said, well, let's boycott Barilla. Um, I myself buy a lot of Barilla pasta, so I could really have uh, an impact there. Uh, but I thought that that was kind of silly to hold the company responsible when they had actually already repudiated Um like what more are you trying to accomplish with the boycott? Yeah, what that's a good point. What could they have done that would be more? Because they can't reasonably coerce this guy to come out and say something else. Um, or if they did, that it doesn't. That seems to me ethically dubious. Um, what are they going to do? Kidnap his children? I mean, it's yeah. Um, but I mean, do, do, you, do you buy my distinction between these sort of society wide phenomena and these sort of more independent phenomena? And how does that make a difference for boycotting? So, even so, let me yeah. take I, I mentioned the Burlow case. Let me take um, independent person off the table. Let's say we're talking just about a statement made by a company by officials at a company may not represent the thoughts of their rank and file, but it's still an official statement by the company. Uh, But it might not like, uh, so taking up Chick-fil-A, it was in a statements made by the company, but um, uh, you know, we don't know what independent franchise owners of, or I'm assuming Chick-fil-A is franchise, but uh, independent Chick-fil-A franchise owners think. So what then? Yeah, um, I mean, another, another, you asked if I buy your distinction. I mean, I, th- I certainly think um, there is definitely something to uh, some kind of distinction there. Uh, I mean, one of, another, um, another feature of these cases that, you know, seem to re- represent a more society-wide kind of an issue rather than just something like particular with, um, you know, the owner or top management at Mm -hmm. the company is that they just seem to, um, they rep, they represent much more serious injustices, Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, uh, the pre civil rights era, uh, Mm -hmm. or civil rights era South or apartheid South Africa, um, versus, you know, the, even the, even in the case of Chick-fil-A with the, what Dan Cathy said was, opposition he he expressed political views in opposition to gay marriage but um uh well not not that the society in which he was operating has like perfect perfect or even close to perfect um you know uh um like policies or or social environment for um lgbtq people but um also it's not like he was uh, like operating in society Dan Cathy was like instrumental in operating and sustaining in a, in a society that was like practicing something equivalent to um, what blacks in South Africa or the, uh, the American South suffered under. If all, if all Chick-fil-A is closed tomorrow, society would not grind to a halt. Right. <laughs> not most of it anyway, probably. Right, right, right. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess another thing that, that perplexes me a little bit still about the, the collateral damage concern is that, you know, um, it's, it's not like as a matter of ethics or justice, we have to buy or not buy Jimmy John's or Chick-fil-A. Mm-hmm. I take it that I can buy sandwiches from Jimmy John's if I want to, but I, it would also be fine if I, um, sorry, I just got a spam call on my phone that went to my computer. Uh, but it would, it would all, you know, it's all, it's also fine if I decide I want to shop at Subway or a local sandwich shop. And, you know, if I've been a loyal Jimmy John's customer for a long time and then decide I want to buy my sandwiches elsewhere, uh, it's not like the, you know, some kind of potential impact of my decision as a consumer upon uh, employees or franchise owners at Jimmy John's seems like it should. It's really something that I have to take into account very much. So why would that change for boycotts? Well, um, I, I mean, I take it it's broadly the case that we all have a right to buy the products we prefer um, I mean, we, we're ethically free to do that, which is after, uh, the Popeye sandwich comes back, I will definitely be boycotting Chick-fil-A, um, just because it's much superior. Uh, I admire, I admire your principle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, fried chicken something I feel very strongly about. Um, uh, so yes, we're we're all free to um, uh, act on our own preferences, but I it does feel different to me, to be honest. If uh, if you're acting on an ethical principle and you're um, deliberately, I mean, it just changes the whole character of the act because the justification is so different. It's not a question of. Uh, yeah me just buying something else. For one thing, I'm actively trying to uh, impose a cost on somebody else to change their behavior. Um, It seems to move us into the political arena in a way that me just preferring one sandwich to another doesn't. Yeah. Um, So I have to justify myself in political terms, um, which I think we're both comfortable that sometimes we can do that. Yes. But... Uh, but I do have to go to that length. Um, and also, uh, when we were talking privately, you said something like, well, uh, if I don't buy from Jimmy John's, maybe I'll go to Subway or whatever other Quiznos competitor. Um, so if I'm you know, putting the same, you didn't quite put it this way, but if I'm putting the same money out into the market, um, if I'm just uh, still buying sandwiches only from a different firm, from a different um, supplier, maybe it's all just a wash, sort of. Um, there's you're, you're not generating, you're, the good you produce for other people is profit um, for another, for a company. Um, uh, you know, employment for someone who works for that company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and harm, the only potential harm, if you even want to view it as harm, is uh, not patronizing another company, which any one place you buy a sandwich from, you're by definition not buying from another sandwich place. So you're doing this. So maybe it's the same level of good, the same level of harm. I actually don't like that reasoning. Um, on liberal grounds, because, um, you know, there's, there's a basic idea here. Uh, Michael Sandel made a, a good point about um, liberal philosophy and I think how Rawls kind of represented in, in advance on old utilitarian kind of political philosophy, which is what dominated uh, before uh, Rawls's day. Um, if you think about, you know, if you look at uh, politics in a utilitarian way, it's um, if 
some action does some good to one people and some harm to another, and the good to some people outweighs the harm to the other, well, you have to go with the good just because it sums out. And when you think that way, you're, you're kind of viewing society in a way that's very analogous to the way a single person acts. So um, maybe I felt like um, getting on to the computer to record a dialogue with Carson, but I also kind of felt like taking a nap. So just my, my desire to come on here and talk to you outweighed my desire to go take a nap. So this is what I decided to do. So it's, there's some desire, some, some greater desire, some lesser desire. They're competing. You pick the greater. But when we have a society and interpersonal uh, dynamics in which there are rights and duties, we don't just pick the stronger and just always outweigh the minority. That's why, you know, in our Constitution, we have these great clauses that say, Congress shall make no law, um, that say, you know, even if the vast majority of people agree that uh, Protestantism is the best religion, they can't impose on the minority um, because they feel more strongly about it, uh, that that shall be the religion of the United States. They don't have the right to do that, even though they may, it may, they may be the vast majority and they may even feel more strongly about it than the minority. And it may bring them more utility to establish a religion than it would bring the minority to protect it or not. But, uh, but you can make up other examples. Um, so, I, I don't feel comfortable just saying, well, I'll just buy for another shop, but I can screw over everyone who works for Jimmy John's. Um, you know, I just declare you the loser. Um, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to put those words in your mouth. That makes you sound more callous than you, I know you to be. But uh, but you, you see my point. Um, you can't just wreak economic havoc and pick losers. Because I'm thinking about this, you know, the Trump phenomenon, too. I think one of the interesting areas of in, uh, introspection that's come up is, did we take the losers of trade seriously enough, you know? But we had this problem where um, free trade is good. Most economists think, free tra- uh, vast majority of economists think, free trade is good overall when you sum out the amount of utility wealth generated. Um, and there are, but there are some losers, some very small minority who were really hurt by uh, trade. And, um, you know, uh, economists said kind of before, you know, 10 years ago, we're kind of like, well, you know, it's unfortunate. We'll try to, maybe we, try to move those people into better jobs, give vocational training, et cetera. But um, they weren't too worried about it. And now I think we're thinking more seriously about those kinds of issues. And one of the advantages of liberalism is, uh, as Christ said, it'll leave 99 on the hill to save one. Um, And I, I think that's a philosophical advantage of the view um, so I've been talking an ungodly long time. So, uh, do you have any reaction to that? Um, I guess I'm a little bit resistant to drawing the analogy, um, between, you know, thinking about the individuals potentially harmed through something like a boycott versus people who lose out in trade or, you know, minorities whose rights or interests would be, you know, outweighed by some kind of a utility, utilitarian, like policy calculation. Hmm. Um, but I guess I, but I, I mean, I agree with you that when somebody is harmed economically, um, like that tends to matter. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that <laughs> yeah. the, the potential for boycotts to harm innocent people um, is one reason why people taking part in boycotts need to like think seriously about what they're doing and whether it's really worthwhile and justified. Um, You know, that might be a reason why, um, why 
the decision of whether to boycott requires kind of more public justification and more reflection and more due diligence um, than like just the private consumption decision of where to buy your sandwiches. I, right. That. Okay. Yeah. I was, there's an example I thought of earlier and I, I let it drop for some reason, but um uh, in opposition to the Iraq War, something that was when when the war uh, when it was just starting and the fighting was more intense, um, people were speaking out against it and protesting against it, etc. Yeah. And it uh, it was the people who did protest against it. It was thrown in their face um, that you know potentially you're hurting the soldiers who are fighting and you're making it harder for us to win the war because of course people, um, our opponents can see what's going on at home and can see that people are protesting. So that makes us an enemy divided. Um, and the same thing happened in the Vietnam war. So that, I mean, and I don't think there's any way to say that they weren't right about that. The critics. Uh, yeah. Yes. Right. The critics of the protesters. Yeah. Uh, yes. Right. I mean, the protesters were making it harder for soldiers and et cetera, but they were also right to do it. So, I mean, that's, um, there was a serious harm here that I, I think was still politically justified. So that's just to bring home the idea that you've been banging on that sometimes there is a, um, a significant amount of harm, uh, to innocent people, that's still justified. So um, I, I just, yeah, I just want to put that across. Um, okay, I think we've uh, said what we need to about the uh, sort of the banal problems. Um, there, you introduced me to this paper. Um, is this someone you know at Penn? or This is uh, someone who used to be a professor at Penn, now a professor at University of Toronto, Wahid Hussein. Um, uh, I know him a little bit. Um, not not well. I've met him a couple of times. Okay. Uh, so he has this, I, this idea, uh, which I think is instructive, of social change, economic consumerism. Um, do you want to give us a brief? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So so this is a this is a paper Wahid Hussein published in uh, the journal Philosophy and Public Affairs. Um, I think in twenty twelve. And it's available uh, online, so there'll be a link. Yep. And he compares ethical consumerism, so things like boycotts or, you know, boycotts where you buy stuff from a company like, you know, to, uh, to a form of impermissible vigilantism, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and his basic idea is that, you know, in a democracy, um, you know, we, we, people have a right to participate as equals. Um, well, hang on. You're you're jumping ahead to the critique. Okay, excuse me. Um, uh, but just what is the idea of social change, ethical consumerism? Okay, right. Oh, excuse me. So this is the idea of ethical consumerism, whose purpose is to um, uh, bring about some social change. You know, change how some actors are acting to bring about a policy change. Um, uh, yeah, change the laws. Um, so he distinguishes it from, um, uh, like he mentions clean hands, ethical consumerism where, you know, oh, I'm not, I'm not trying to like, you know, change the world by not buying this product. It's just that this product is associated with something that I think is morally objectionable. And so I oh, don't Coca want to be part of that. So Coca-Cola has gotten in trouble for child labor laws in the past. So it's like, if I don't buy Coke because of that. I'm just saying, um, you know, I don't want to support that. I don't want to be morally implicated in that. Um, right, right. And so for an individual person who doesn't buy Coke, I would imagine a lot of people who boycott Coke because of their child labor laws want to change uh, child labor laws and Coke's child oh, labor practices. And so that might be a form of uh, social change, ethical consumerism. But if you imagine somebody who's like 
not who doesn't have that as a goal, but is just mm-hmm. like, you know, I, I don't want to be involved in this, then that would be an example of the clean hands kind of ethical consumerism. Um, and then I think that the third kind he mentions, and the, I don't think these are meant to be exhaustive, is um, uh, like, uh, what's the term? Uh, emotivist consumerism. So, you Expressivist. Know, uh, uh, yes, expressivist consumerism. Um, so, it's, yes. Uh, so, I see how you made that association for metaethics, but yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, uh, just kind of saying "boo Coke," I guess, right, to, yeah. to make the metaethics kind of connection. Um, uh, but r- rather than like viewing the the that act of a boycott as something that is aimed at changing Coke's right. behavior or changing policy. So by contrast to the two ones, two kinds of uh, ethical consumer, well, broadly, first of all, ethical consumerism is any consumption that um, is made partly uh, on the basis of some moral political dimension. Right. As opposed Uh, to just like preferences about, you know, what you like and how, you know, how much you can afford. Right. And then, um, Social change ethical consumerism is specifically when I'm trying to get other people to act differently by my consumption choices. So right. the people who are boycotting Chick-fil-A, presumably one wanted gay marriage to become the policy across the country, which it wasn't at the time. Um, and two wanted people, other people to adopt different attitudes um, about speaking uh, uh, against gay marriage or gay rights in general, LGBTQ rights in general. Uh, and I think they really want to change other people's beliefs and attitudes and values. But anyway, you look at it, they're trying to um, change the political uh, and moral behaviors of some third party um, or, uh, or, yeah. yeah. Or not even really th- probably some third party, but the second party too. the right. the person from whom they're not buying the person they're boycotting. Um, so, so that's the idea of social change, ethical consumerism. And I, I, I like that idea. And so there's this, problem that follows from it, which is uh, or potential problem, which follows from it, which is sort of, uh, is it coercive and is it preempting the um, deliberative processes of democracy? Um, And that's a basically the way. And uh, so you were jumping ahead to Hussein's critique of it, which is like, um, we already have a way of handling political differences and differences of values, which is we debate and legislate. So shouldn't we deal with the gay marriage problem through that avenue? And if we don't, are we um, somehow, well, uh, here, you're the professional. Take it up. Um, what, what, yeah, so... So here's what I have in, here's what I think Hussein might be worried about here mm-hmm. is, um, you know, take a very economically powerful actor like the Koch brothers or George Soros or something like that. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people worry that um, people like the Kochs or Soros exercise an inordinate amount, an illegitimate amount of influence over the political process in a way that is um, kind of violates like basic standards of democratic equality. I think. Can I, can I give a so, example of that? Please. Um, George Soros in particular, um, completing my idiom here of picking on my own. Um, George Soros became interested in uh, criminal reform and um, lowering sentencing, which a lot of people are interested in now. And he started giving money to districts attor- or uh, district attorneys all across in cities all across the country, big influential cities all yeah. across the country. 
Now, I'm an old-fashioned sort of person, maybe. Um, I think that the people deciding who's district attorney within a city should be the people who live in that city. And um, seeing this outside actor making a real change in these sorts of elections uh, bothered me a lot. So I, I just bring that as a concrete example of it seemed uh, not to be the sort of democratic process where the people in a city debate decide what they want and uh, when they disagree, fight it out politically and choose what at least the majority want. Right, right, exactly. And you could see a, an analogous kind of problem happening in a, happening in a boycott where mm -hmm. uh, the extent to which you uh, an individual or a group has the power to exert influence over a their society and the policies of their government through boycotts depends on their economic power. Um, economic power is not distributed equally, um, you know, at all. And so uh, if you have people exerting pressure on the political system through um, things like boycotts, then it's going to um, allow these economic inequalities that exist in our society to, um, to affect people's ability to affect political change in a way that, you know, seems to undermine kind of ideas of democratic equality, where we all, in some sense, get to have an equal say in what kind of a society we live in. So um, one of the questions would be, do we have the corporate tax policy, the uh, various kinds of corporate policies that uh, the American people want right now, or do we have the ones that the Koch brothers want? Because the Koch right. brothers put a lot of money, a lot of time, energy, advocacy into changing those policies. And the effect of that seems to be that the American people um, uh, are not very well represented, um, which uh, the big book about this is Affluence and Influence, which I haven't actually read. But I, I understand makes a pretty strong case that the policy, the policy Congress makes is pretty slanted towards these big moneyed interests. Um, right. um, so that, I, that everybody's either worried about George Soros or the Koch brothers. Uh, I think the more principled people are worried about both. Um, so why shouldn't I have the same worry about boycotts? Um, yeah, well, well, I'm not sure that you shouldn't have the same worry, but I guess I, I kind of wonder what a position like this really amounts to. Um, you know, so I, I asked you, this is a challenge to the, the our, in our previous discussion about harms to workers. Like mm -hmm. if, if the cause that a boycott is advancing is really uh, compelling and the boycott seems like a good way to advance that cause. Um, would we really allow like the possibility of some harms to third part, innocent third parties to um, kind of override reasons that we would have in favor of boycotting in that case. And I guess I, I would think the same thing about these kinds of democratic equality concerns. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if the cause that uh, a boycott is advancing is, 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 is extremely compelling and well justified, um, would we really want to say, oh, like, don't do that unless, um, don't do that. What you should really be doing is, um, you know, engaging in, in some uh, kind of through more uh, official channels of, of de democratic deliberation. Um, I mean, so imagine that we live in a perfectly just society where uh, the political system does represent everybody equally um, in the way that uh, deliberative Democrats think is mm -hmm. required. Um, Joshua Cohen's paradise. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, then it, then it does seem like, oh, well, th there's this other, you know, uh, there's this way other than boycotting that um, respects all these procedural values that at least some people think are important. I think they're sometimes important. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard to see like why, if you were living in a perfectly just society, um, if you accept those basic kind of assumptions of deliberative Democrats, why, why, you know, 
on what grounds you could justify boycotting rather than pursuing change in some other way. But the thing is, I guess one one of my reactions to this kind of argument is that our society isn't really anything like that. Um, You know, the same kinds of inequalities about ability to influence the political system that Hussein is worried about um, from differences in economic power also affect how much people are able to um, engage with the political system through more official channels. Um, and so, uh, so given that we live in a, in a much less than perfectly just society, I think that if, um, like if there's a cause that could be advanced, advanced by a boycott that would make our society more just, um, to say, well, you shouldn't do that because of these, you know, procedural values that if they hypothetically were respected would give you an equal say, um, seems a little weird to me. Well, this, I, uh, this really raises my antenna. Um, on, on the one hand, I, I do take your point that we basically all societies are radically unjust. Um, I think our society is radically unjust even compared to what's feasible in, in the sort of short and middle term. Um, and I think that that is something that should inform our political thinking, uh, both practically and in the more sort of philosophically abstract. Um, though I don't like to contrast philosophical and practical too, too much. Um, uh, but I do think suspending um, ideals of reciprocity and political justice and forbearance uh, until we have a politically perfect situation is a very dangerous game. Um, so in, in, uh, part of... I agree with that, but does, does permitting boycotts of good causes involve doing those things? Well, I, you know, I've been thinking about this. Um, so I mentioned that Agnes Callard piece to you. Yes. Um, I, I spend a fair amount of time thinking about speech and, and discourse in ways I, I think it's going wrong. Right. Uh, in This is the piece where she argues against philosophers. Um, yeah. Signing petitions. Yes. Uh, and it's the same sort of set of problems that we're discussing with sort of deliberative democracy. Agnes Keller takes this sort of charmingly austere position that people should not do anything over and above rational persuasion, putting forward rational arguments, uh, even to the extent of uh, signing petitions, experts, uh, philosophers, for instance, or she doesn't economists. say people, right? She says philosophers, or does she say people? Well, I, I think that's sort of a dance she dances throughout the piece. Is she has okay. the more yeah. specific case and the more general case, and right. sometimes when it's convenient, she retreats to the more. But I mean, really, her principles license this in a more general way. Um, if she's going to use the justifications she's going to use, she's going to have to talk about the more general kinds of cases. Um, but um, basically, her point is the act of, let's say, moral philosophers signing a big petition and saying, we as expert moral philosophers agree with this, is a kind of coercion. Um, is they're using their authority, their big fancy titles, their somebody initial, somebody professor of blank kind of authority uh, to bludgeon people into believing something, uh, or bludgeon sounds emotive, but, uh, you know. I mean, it sound coercive. I was going to yeah. object, I mean, is it really coercive? It's an appeal to authority. Um, well, but it, well, it, it's it's certainly non or mm, this isn't certain, but Agnes Callard seems certain of it. Um, it's um, she she treats it as non rational, right? Yeah. So you're you're doing something other than giving people a reason. 
um, that you think will have an effect on their beliefs, uh, other than giving them good reasons for that belief, she says. I don't, I don't quite buy that. But uh, uh, so anytime you're doing that, you're sort of preempting deliberative democracy. But I was going to say my own puzzle is um, I, 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 I look at sort of discourse and uh, left-wing discourse in particular, mostly because of sort of my pony. Um, and I think that, and I've been saying for a few years now, that the kinds of declaiming that goes on and the kinds of um, trying to leverage uh, people's reputations and trying to use uh, vituperative language and uh, even in some cases real sort of abuse, uh, sort of uh, expressive abuse, sort of um, people constantly having to receive messages that they're a bad person, that they're uh, rejected by their society, that they're not valued. Um, I think that, that that kind of exercise of power really matters. I think it has a very significant negative effect on our ability to deliberate as a democracy. Um, and I think that that kind of exercise of power should stop. But I, I do share, but I say that in spite of the fact that I think the difference between that kind of speech and the kind of speech that I approve of is relatively subtle. Um in a way, these people are the people who do the kind of speech I don't like um, are not picking anyone's pocket or breaking anyone's leg in Jefferson's terms. Um, they're uh, so, but I do still have the intuition that boycotts are uh, sometimes justified, probably justified fairly often. Um, so, I'm trying to square with myself how I justify the use of power in one case, but not in the other. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And so the other being like petitions, like you agree with, you agree broadly with. Um, I, I, I don't have a problem with petitions, but what I have is this sort of um, writing the way ta Coates writes and saying, you know, really attacking people's motives and attacking people's reputations and trying to um, really convince people that people who disagree with him are bad people and should not be listened to and shouldn't have a chance to speak, which I think is what he regularly does. Um, I think that's a real problem. Um, so, uh, and I think it marginalizes some voices which our broader society should hear from. And it makes our debates more shallow. Um, and we lose that sort of information from some people that deliberative democracy tells us is important. That might be right. Yeah. And I think there's a, I think something like shunning or shaming, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess I think that that has kind of an important social role to play sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Uh, I think that, like, maybe not in all cases, but usually, you know, overt, overt racists mm -hmm. ought to be shunned, and that can be an effective way of kind of affirming, like, basic social values that we ought to have. Someone uh, like David Duke should not be a member of polite society. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I guess the problem with those tactics, though, f when they're used about things that we don't have much of a social consensus on, especially when it's topics that, like, huge swaths of our society disagree with, is that um, it's just not clear. Well, one problem is that it's not clear to me that it's very effective, even if your goal is to you know, get more people to th adopt the right beliefs about matters of morality and politics and justice and, and give up the wrong ones. Um, 
you know, I think it contribute, it can contribute to a kind of uh, polarized media environment um, where, you know, everybody is sort of just talking to people that they um, agree with and where um, kind of real rational engagement among people who have different beliefs about important and controversial social issues is, um, is rare and difficult to do. So I agree with what I think I heard you say that sometimes it just comes down to pure political pragmatism. Um, like creationism is yeah. a, is a view that's sort of shatteringly stupid uh, and just really kind of doesn't even get off the ground in a basic rational way. But unfortunately, tragically, about 40% or more of the United States population believes it. So um, there's nothing for it that I can see except to debate it and to, um, you know, God bless Eugenie Scott and Massimo Piliucci and <laughs> Philip Kitcher and the various people who have um, manned the battlements and debated creationists and written books and tried to, you know, address this social problem. And the same thing can be true in a moral case. Like if you go back to, you know, 1963, uh, maybe the, the, the arguments for segregation um, were completely stupid and unjustifiable in any kind of moral sense. I'm sure, I'm sure they were, uh, but there was nothing for uh, Martin Luther King or um, uh, uh, President Johnson to do but to debate them because a huge part of the country still believed in segregation. So, um, you know, I, I, I think they did a venerable thing in fighting against it in that way. Um, so hopefully Joe Biden's listening, but go ahead. Oh, well, I was just thought it was interesting. So I objected to your use of coercion before um, describing, you know, things like petitions or, or whatever, you know. Yeah. However you put that. Uh, uh, whereas like the action, a lot of the actions taken as part of the civil rights era mm -hmm. definitely were coercive. It's not oh, like yeah. the civil rights was kind of won by just by persuading people. Um, you know, there was literal state coercion that happened there that I think was justified. Um, yes, uh, that is true. Okay. That, 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 I think that's a good place to, um, transition to the next part of our conversation, the last part of our conversation, because I think that is true. Um, so I, I, I and I, I talked to Dan Kaufman a little bit about this, um, where I, I do find sort of Agnes Callard's vision of politics um, too austere. And I kept, when I was reading uh, her her piece, um, I kept thinking of Selma, actually, um, because what they were, what the organizers of Selma were doing was something well, or it was certainly not the kind of rational persuasion Agnes Gallard seems to have in mind. But there was a point to it that can be sort of sussed out in terms of deliberative democracy. Um, and, you know, what people saw at Selma, which is, you know, young, squeaky clean looking black people um, getting, you know, bitten by dogs and sprayed with hoses and uh, hit with truncheons. That's about as emotionally, um, evocative about as non-rational as it gets in, in some sense, right? It's, it was supposed to upset people. Yeah. Um, and it was supposed to bring home the idea uh, that you can't continue to separate, you can't continue to support um, uh, segregation. Um, it, it's not just an ordinary opinion. It's, uh, uh, 
it wasn't up for debate, right, any longer. That was part of the message. Right. But there, uh, there is a way, which I think Martin Luther King, for instance, deeply cared about deliberative processes. And there are, even though um, the sort of civil rights leaders felt justified in sort of acting outside those procedural norms because of the unjust world they were living in, they still did a lot of things which made clear that they believed in those norms. So this gets back to our conversation about when and to what extent do you suspend those kinds of procedural norms because the society is imperfect. Right, right. Um, so, what? But we've um, one thing they did, um, which is I think very important, is that they made their justifications for what they were doing known, and um, they they really um, uh, he, hammered on that. And they, like nowadays, there's a kind of meme or whatever you want to call it, an idea that echoes around, which is that, and that this certainly comes up in boycott politics, um, which is we don't have to justify ourselves. You have an obligation to figure it out. Um, so these boycotts are not usually ac uh, accompanied by here's why we're boycotting you. Here's why we think you're wrong. Here's why we have to take these extraordinary steps. Um, and here's why we hope you'll change your mind. It's, it's more, how dare you, you're immoral, and why should we have to explain it to you and go sit in the corner and think it, figure it out on your own. Um, I, mean, I realize that sounds overstated. I'm sorry, I don't think that it is. Um, so, so it wouldn't. So, do you buy my um, my yeah. uh, accompanying justifications is an important um, kind of showing respect to deliberative processes, even while we're suspending some of those norms to engage in more extraordinary kind of politics. Uh, how, how do you react? Yeah, that, that seems right to me. I mean, um, I mean, given what you've been saying, it makes me, it's been making me think about the, the role that uh, things like boycotts can play kind of in deliberation as, in a, in, as a form of deliberation. I mean, mm -hmm. one thing that boycotting, I guess, seems pretty good at, at least in, in some of the, in the cases we're talking about, but there's a selection bias there because they're the famous ones is that it's, it's good at getting things on people's radar. It's good at yes. going spiral. Um, I mean, widespread boycotts are good at just making an issue impossible to ignore. Even if one people just want to keep getting on with their lives because it, it disrupts their regular lives. So they kind of can't not think about it, even if, if they want to. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if, if we think about boycotts as playing that kind of a role in public deliberation, um, yeah. it does seem to me that that would be undermined if, um, the accompanying message is not, here's why, the, here's the cause that we're boycotting and here's why it's important, but rather, uh, you know, you, if, if you were a decent person, then you should already understand and agree with what we're doing. And if you don't understand it and don't think you agree with it, then, you know, kind of we have, we have nothing to productive to talk about. That, that. Right. And, and it's important for me to say that um, the, the justification you just gave for boycotts was in terms of deliberation. It gets something into the deliberation. So the, one, one of the things that bothered me and what Agnes Keller had to say is sort of if that anything that's not a sort of premise, premise, conclusion argument um, is sort of making the process less deliberative. But that's right. surely not the case. And it's not the case because of the point that you hit upon earlier, which is because of an imperfect society, um, premise, premise, conclusion arguments don't necessarily have the effect that they should have, especially, um, you know, 
there were all kinds of things about the segregated South that made it easy to ignore um, uh, the suffering of black people at the hands of the segregated South. Uh, and Martin Luther King standing at a podium did wonderful things, but Martin Luther King standing at a podium was never going to bring home the human cost by itself. So you needed to show, you needed Bull Connor hitting people on television um, to, to get that into the deliberative processes. And it made the society, the non-rational sort of presentation made it, made the overall process more deliberative and not less exactly because it wasn't just a rational argument. But what I've been hammering home is every Selma should be accompanied from it by a letter for Birmingham jail. Uh, that you, it, when you, when it's not accompanied by the rational aspect, then it does cease to become deliberative in ways that begin to alarm me. Um, yeah, so, and it and it seems like it's not necessarily a very effective tactic either. I mean, again, hard to say based on anecdotes, but uh, all these boycotts that annoyed you that made you reach out <laughs> to me in the first place. Um, the most successful ones have like been successful in the fact that they weren't forgotten about like three weeks later. Yeah. But it's n- doesn't seem like they really like had the kind of power that would lead to any sort of social change. Um, and I mean, maybe one reason for that is that there wasn't like a broader set of conversations that they kicked off about the issue that they that was kind of central to them. Um, I take it there wasn't like a big surge in interest in, um, you know, the rights of like African megafauna that um, (laughs) people like Jimmy John Leotoad like to, or at one point liked to hunt after the Jimmy John's boycott. It just kind of, it just kind of came and went like so many, uh, you know, viral memes. Right. And reason why. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, another point on that same topic is, um, and it's a Rawlsian point, is um, how uh, money and wealth is part of how people keep track of how important they are to the society, how much they see they count as as peers, and um, when people send out the message. Um, we view you as so immortal that we won't even trade with you. I won't buy a chicken sandwich from you because you're that appalling to me. Um, That if you don't say why, and you don't, and then especially if you don't say why, and you don't leave the door open to some kind of coming back into the community. And you'd say, you know, if you say, I hate that you're, I'm so angry about what you're doing that I'm not going to trade with you, but I hope you'll change your mind and come back in and we can be fellow citizens again. That's a very different message than just sort of seeming as it must to these people, like you're just shutting the door. And I I think that's why there's such disaffection that these kinds of boycotts raise. A lot of people rallied to Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Um, And there were, you know, all these pictures on Twitter of, um, people who are now wearing or who were probably later wearing Hillary for prison shirts, um, you know, lining up out the door at Chick-fil-A. And that's not good politics for us or for anyone. Um, uh, Any thought? Uh, Yeah, definitely. I mean, one, well, I just had a thought about the, the, beginning of our discussion about harms and how one of, one of the funny things about a lot of these cases, it seems like the boycott is if anything, maybe good for the target of the boycott because it raises the profile. You get a backlash where people Mm -hmm. on the other side of the issue, the people they were selling to in the first place. Exactly. (laughs) You know, end up supporting uh, the place uh, even more strongly. Um, But yeah, I, I, um, the same thing happens with no platforming. The same right. thing happens yes. with the platforming is often, the- often it seems like, yeah, yeah. I oh, guess right. like is Milo a limit to that? Um, 
No, be- oh god, that's another. Oh, discussion. Never mind. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> he got deplatformed from both sides, which is okay. Works. Right. When he got right. deplatformed from only one side, he got bigger. When suddenly right wing people also turned their backs on him for totally independent reasons, that's when he got no actually sank. But sorry, you were going to make a point. No, no, I I'm the one who brought him up. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the other point I was going to make is I, I, I do think that there's, I mean, ar- you know, arguably one of the virtues of commercial society is it allows people with very different backgrounds, different religions, different opinions about uh, matters of ethics and justice to, you know, come together and cooperate with each other and benefit from each other, even if they're not able to uh you know, work out those deeper disagreements. Yeah, reach a consensus. And exactly. Um, it, it doesn't depend on consensus in order for people to um, right. interact with each other peacefully and in a way that is mutually beneficial. And but it does, it I, does, we do need a consensus on the norms. To we need a consensus on certain things, but, it on, but only, yeah, you know, more... Um, yeah, the norms that are sort of governing the terms of interaction, but not like everything that people think about or mat- matters that are more, you know, personal or or even important political matters that are not maybe directly related to the content of the sh- of shared norms of social cooperation. Uh, and so I think, you know, one worry I would have if this boycott phenomenon is, you know, something that is growing, um, which I'm not sure that it is, but if it is, is that it it seems to kind of undermine that. Um, You know, I think it's good that, uh, broadly speaking, that people who um, have different views about uh, gay marriage can still, you know, get their chicken sandwiches from the same place. And, and, uh, you know... Politically important, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so I think, I mean, clearly it's worth drawing lines, you know, I think, again, I think shunning uh, has a role to play. Um, I don't think that people with, like, deep racist views that they uh, advocate overtly, you know, should be cooperated with in the same way that we cooperate with, with other members of our society. But I... I, I am worried about go, you know, our society going too far in the direction of, um, you know, let's suss out the positions of everybody who we might be supporting economically with our purchasing decisions and then only buy from the places who um, adhere to, to our values. Um, that, that seems like, uh, it seems like it seems likely to exacerbate polarization and social conflict and to undermine social cooperation and in ways that are extremely problematic and undesirable. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, what you said about one of the strengths of liberalism is that it accommodates very different views is, uh, I seem to be flogging Rawls today, but it's the fact of reasonable difference. It's just, um, it seems like highly intelligent, very well informed, very careful people can come to radically different conclusions on moral subjects in a way they don't in for instance biology or physics um, yeah definitely and, and liberalism is designed partly to accommodate that, and that that's a strong feature of the view all right so i I think we should end on this note that um hooray for liberalism. <laughs> no, I was going to say, do you want to talk about the worthiness of goals? I, I guess it's oh, kind sure. of... Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, ulti- I guess ultimately, like, as I was thinking through what are the criteria that in, in any of these cases uh, would, you know, largely determine whether a boycott, a given boycott is ethically justified or not. I mean, to, mm-hmm. to me, and I guess... Well, yeah, I mean, to me, it, it depends mostly on the worthiness of the cause being advanced. Um, mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times trying to evaluate that in the case of particular boycotts can be pretty helpful. I mean, one issue is that with a lot of these boycotts, it's not even clear what the cause is supposed to be. Yeah. Like in the right. Uber case. Um, not clear. It, well, there are two things you could mean there. Not clear yeah. to the people who are supposed to be uh, the people who are supposed to be changed by the boycott 
or not clear to the people who are enacting the boycott? I think often it's not clear to either. Uh, I would agree, yeah. To me. I mean, in the Uber case, what exactly is being objected to? Is it just Uber? Um, <laughs> is it the fact that they, that Uber uh, eliminated surge pricing during this hour so that people didn't have to pay more for rides when the New York taxi drivers were mm-hmm. refusing to pick people up from JFK? Um, I mean, if if... If the mechanism of surge pricing works the way I would think, that would make it so that that uh, you know people who wanted rides from Uber would have to wait longer. <laughs> so if you don't want people getting rides from the airport, maybe it would have been better for them to eliminate surge pricing than not. I mean, it's just like what the, and I think the same is the case for for Jimmy John's. Uh, you know, is it is it elephant hunting? Um, is it big game hunting? Is it like animal welfare uh, more broadly? Um, I mean, I think that those are very reasonable questions to ask about these boycotts. I, get, I think that they're questions that should be considered seriously and that you should, you know, have some answer to if you're participating in them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I also think that in order to be successful, in order to send like a public message uh uh there needs to be some clarity about what the goal of the boycott is um and so i think in a given one of these cases whether a boycott is justified or not it will depend mostly on whether on its merits the cause that it is trying to further is a good cause and then it'll also depend on whether uh a boycott undertaken in the way a given particular boycott is undertaken represents a good way of advancing that cause. And we can see how sometimes maybe it doesn't, you know, there might be a valuable cause, um, but a boycott just isn't a very good way of advancing it. Maybe it's because it's difficult for the message to kind of get out politically in a way that would have a um, sustained positive effect on the, the discourse from the point Mm -hmm. of view of the boycotters. Um, you know, maybe it would generate a, maybe a boycott would generate a backlash that's right. larger than, um, the initial boycott, uh, um, or would just serve to serve as, you know, free publicity to the, to the target of the boycott. Um, so I, th- to me, those are the places, those are the first places to look, I think, when I'm evaluating the ethics mm-hmm. of a boycott. I think more centrally than, um, you know, the kinds of democratic procedural procedural considerations uh, Wahid Hussein brings up or, or maybe some of the kinds of worries that you were expressing um, mm. associated with that, I guess, Callard essay. Yeah, sort of so, so I think we both agree that um, a boycott should have a worthy uh, object. Right. And you you have emphasized an articulated object, yeah, and that uh, it should have a reasonable chance of achieving that object. Um, right. So I might quibble a little bit with that way of putting it. Okay. I think it can be worth pursuing, you know, low probability gambits for a good enough um, potential. Yeah, but then outcome. We're, we're just arguing about thresholds. Sure. Well, so I, I think that uh, the way I would put it is that the, bo- the, the, the mechanism of a boycott should be a reasonably effective way of um, advancing the cause of the boycott. Uh, and whether it has a reasonably, wh- whether it had, yeah. Uh, and, and that could be compatible with having a pretty high or a pretty low chance of, uh, of actually accomplishing the goal. Um, so maybe maybe the way you were using reasonable, that's kind of already contained in it. In which case, yeah, would... you could. But you would ima- you could imagine saying, "I like the object of this boycott. I'm not going to support it just because I think it has such a low chance of succeeding." Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I yeah. think that's how some people really feel about uh, the BDS movement, for instance. Yeah. Um, um, so that I mean, that's a fairly practical consideration. Okay. Yeah. So I. Th- I don't see daylight between us on that. Um, I want to end with this one worry uh, that the worthiness, 
your your kind of view here, um, because you do move us beyond um, deliberative norms in this way, is we all have to be our own judge of what worthiness is. So it's really decided up to boycotters. So what would you say about, um, let's say, I remember as a boy, uh, What's his, uh, I'm so happy I don't remember his name. Bill O'Reilly. Um, <laughs> and, and, and yet undisgraced Bill O'Reilly, except for the disgrace that all the words that come out of his mouth. But um, he he got he liked to go on these crusades, and he got Pepsi to drop uh, Ludacris at one point. Um, they were doing some advertisements together, and he thought Ludacris was indecent, and this showed that Pepsi was not a family company. And he had a big platform and he applied it to Pepsi. Um, and by his communitarian conservative lights, that was a worthy goal. He was trying to protect culture. Um, so do you have any kind of recourse to say that that was wrong? Yeah, well, so, you know, um, the re- the reason that I think it is worth focusing on the worthiness of the goals is because I think that those are, that's kind of where the moral action is going to be Mm -hmm. whether the boycott is justified or not. Now, of course, in saying that I think a significant determinant of whether a boycott is justified is the worthiness of its goals. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, if you think the goal of your boycott is worthy, then, then it's the right thing to do. You can't just think about it. You can't just think it. You have to be justified in some sense. And so was Riley justified in thinking that? And that's going to that's gonna force us to interrogate, you know, some of the kind of cultural conservative uh, premises underlying he, that. He had his justifications that he was happy to give you, uh, uh, you know, every night at 8 o'clock or, you know, whenever. Right. It's- yeah. Uh, and I think, and I think I would say, I, I, so being not at all familiar with this case happily, oh. I'm, 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 I'm skeptical, I'm skeptical, uh, that I would be sympathetic with his justifications. And I think I would, I would argue that they're not good justifications probably. Um, but yeah, but so this isn't going to be a criterion that we can use like to allow people who deeply disagree about values in our society to determine which boycotts are justified or not in a way that will be satisfying to all of us despite those disagreements. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what is good about it is that it, 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 it directs our attention to, um, to the, the issues that matter in determining whether it is justified, which I think are going to be the particular justifications so uh, maybe, given by the people practicing the boycott. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe the thing to say is how you would react to Bill O'Reilly's boycott, which is to say he's free to propose a boycott and you would try to maybe critique it and dissuade people from following him in it. And in that way, there still is a kind of deliberative uh, negotiated kind of standard of worthiness, which is not just a private standard of worthiness that each side has their own version of. Right. And I'm not saying that if you think, even if you're justified in thinking that another boycott is not worried, I'm not saying that that means that you shouldn't give your reasons for Mm -hmm. thinking that to the, uh, the people who are undertaking the boycott. Um, Yeah. All right. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, Thanks for sticking, sticking with me through this. Well, Um, well, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed the opportunity to think more about, about these issues and, uh, and and, anything you want to get out into the world or. Nope. I'm, I'm good. Me neither. The electric uh, Agora, um and David Ottlinger, O T T L I N G E R at David Ottlinger. Follow me on Twitter. All right. Thanks again, Carson. Thank you, David.